Hello and welcome to the North Carolina Maritime Museum at Southport. My name is Katie Many, and I am the Curator of Education here at the museum. So today you will be going on a semi-guided tour of the exhibit hall through the assistance of my spoken word, closed captioning, and our ASL interpreter, Lisa. So Southport sits at the confluence or the joining of the Cape Fear River, the Intercoastal Waterway, and the Atlantic Ocean. So from right here in Southport, you can see all three kinds of water on this planet. Now let's get started and head over to our Native American exhibit, which is on the left-hand side, and the background colors are brown and green. To begin, the history of the Lower Cape Fear, we must start with our first Native Indigenous people. Initially, explorers throughout this region came in contact with a tribe they named the Cape Fear Indians. All records we have of this tribe are from those white European settlers. There are no written or oral histories from the tribe itself. So much of what we know about this tribe, the Cape Fear Indians, are from diaries and books written after the fact or information gathered from other tribes in the area. North Carolina has indigenous peoples throughout all 100 counties and they still exist today. So in the Lower Cape Fear region, we see tribes such as the Waccamaw the Lumbee, and the Kohari tribes. What you'll see throughout this exhibit are artifacts that date from the pre-Paleo times to the woodland cultures and wonderful dioramas that show a glimpse of perhaps what Indigenous peoples and Indigenous mariners saw and interacted with. In this diorama, you will see a Native American tribesperson in a dugout canoe utilizing a fishing weir. This fishing trap allows fish to be caught in a stick enclosure, enclosure and the Native American tribesperson can take out the fish that they need that day without having to use all the fish that they caught. Once you are done exploring this exhibit, then turn your back and you will be looking at our pirate exhibit. Pirates are mean people. They stole things and murdered others to get what they wanted. So while Steve Bonnet the pirate that we have documentation for here in the Cape Fear region. While he is called the gentleman pirate, he was not a nice person. He still stole things and he still killed people, but he had an education and he had money. Prior to him becoming a pirate, he was a sugar planter on the island nation of Barbados. He decided one day that he was done with that job, so he hired a crew, bought a vessel, and sailed the high seas as a pirate. Now he was friends with Blackbeard, however Blackbeard is not documented as being here in the Cape Fear, so we do not get to talk about him. Throughout this exhibit you will see artifacts from what is believed to be the Queen Anne's Revenge which was Blackbeard's vessel, and potentially some things from Steve Bonnet himself. Steve Bonnet, even though he was a terrible navigator and he did not know how to sail a ship, he got the same punishment as all pirates. He was taken to Charleston, South Carolina after being captured by a pirate hunter named Colonel Rhett, and he stood trial and then ultimately was executed by hanging. And then he was put out to sea 
at the water line. So his grave is where the water meets the land. So there's no marked grave. Once you are finished exploring this pirate exhibit, turn back to the other side and we will be learning about colonial North Carolina. The colony of North Carolina tried to be settled many times because of fires, native peoples fending them off, and illness, it did not take until Brunswick Town. Brunswick Town was the port city of colonial North Carolina, and there are ruins still that can be seen if you travel to Brunswick Town Fort Anderson State Historic Site, which is on 133 as you drive towards Wilmington. Brunswick Town, as a as a port exported naval stores. Naval stores are the products of longleaf pine trees. So tar, pitch, turpentine, as well as the lumber itself were exported worldwide and made North Carolina very wealthy. As you walk through this exhibit, you will see our friend Janet Shaw. She was a Scottish woman who visited Brunswick town to see her brother and wrote a diary of her travels. Now it notoriously speaks poorly of this area. She did not like its people or the dirty nature of the streets. While many are upset by the way she talks about this area, historians love to hear a different perspective. Finally, in this exhibit, you will see a piece of our Fort Johnston history. Fort Johnston is now the brick building that sits behind the Maritime Museum towards the river. And it was a colonial era fort. We have the original 10 keys. And directly next to that is a beautiful nine pounder cannon that you can navigate around and see what each of the six people did in order to fire that cannon. This cannon is believed to have come off a pirate ship and trust me, you can't hurt it. When you're finished exploring, turn slightly back and go towards our quarantine station. Now that you are near our quarantine station, you can learn about medicine through time. So from the age of sale to present day. You can learn how diseases affect the body, when vaccines were instituted, and how people during World War I figured out that they didn't exactly have to go to work if they told their employer they had the Spanish flu. While you're exploring the diorama and model of the quarantine station, remember that this was the last quarantine station here in the region. It stood on stilts and pilings out in the Cape Fear River. And today, if you travel out to Baldhead Island, the ferry has to swing around the last platform. The station did burn, so it is no longer out in the river. And when you reach the far side of the exhibit, you will see a map showing where all of the quarantine stations were in this region. Quarantine stations are important because disease spreads when you disembark or get off a ship in a port. Just like today, quarantine stations are there to protect citizens and to keep diseases as small as possible. After you've pushed all the buttons and lit up all the buildings in the model, head towards the very tall cutout of the Menhaden fisherman Mihai. Menhaden fishing is not an easy job. It took a lot of manual labor and long hours and it was a smelly job. So to fish for these small silver and purple fish, 
a mother ship would go out into our waterways and one person would climb into the crow's nest as the spotter and look for the schools of fish running in, in the water. The Hayden fish do swim in schools for protection and we are told that from that crow's nest they have a shimmer that goes down their back. Typically, Menhaden vessels were crewed by African-American men and boys, and the captain and spotter were white. Now, here in the Lower Cape Fear region, we have many stories of African-American men owning their own Menhaden vessels. So this is not the case everywhere, but we do have some of those stories here. Nehi, or Elias Gore, is one of those stories. So he stands, his cutout stands at, at his actual height. He was seven feet, eight inches tall, and he was nicknamed Nehi. Now he was a Menhaden fisherman. He owned his own Menhaden boat, and throughout his life, he also worked at the Wilmington shipyard. What you may be able to hear or see on the screen are a group of older Manhattan fishermen singing sea shanties. So sometimes when these boats were out in the water and they were pulling up the nets trying to catch the Manhattan fish, they would sing sea shanties to stay in with them. Now we have documentation that says they did not do this every time and I imagine it would be very hard work to be singing and working. So when the spotter found a school of Menhaden fish, they would drop purse boats and all three vessels would work together to stretch this large net around the school of fish and pull it close to the mothership, that main vessel. Once that happened, they used a dip net to scoop out the fish like a ladle and drop them at the deck of the Menhaden vessel. Then they would be taken to a processing plant and turned into livestock feed, paint, cosmetics, and other things. You just can't eat them. After you have finished exploring this rich maritime history, take a look through the periscope and head around the corner to learn about piloting and navigation. From right here at the end of the exhibit hall is the best view of the Cape Fear River joining the other two water systems. This is where you will see large container ships making the turn to go into Wilmington or back out to sea. So when the vessels get close, about nine miles off shore, the pilot goes out to meet it. You can see an older picture of some of the pilots that are still active and a few that are retired on the wall opposite the windows. But these pilots are responsible for navigating the vessel into and out of the river. It is very dangerous to be on a boat in the river. Cape Fear gets its name because it is fearful to navigate with shifting shoals and sandbars you really don't know exactly what's underneath the water unless you are very knowledgeable. So these pilots have been through apprenticeships and have practiced for hours and hours and they navigate the big container ships and tankers into and out of the river. For more information about these pilots and the process of them getting on and off the vessels and what it entails, please visit our YouTube channel and click on the different playlists. After exploring the Jacob's Ladder, that wooden ladder that is used to climb up and down the container ships out at sea and all of the other items that are hanging on the wall, continue straight and you will be entering into our Deadly Dozen exhibit. to the Deadly Dozen exhibit. Throughout this corner of the exhibit hall, you will learn about hurricanes. 
So we've selected 12 hurricanes to look at specifically, as well as learn how to prepare, live through, and recover from storms. Before the National Weather Service became the National Weather Service, there were many predecessor agencies that helped to warn mariners and citizens of the coastal communities about impending weather. Our miniature weather tower was one of those things. So long before your phone would send you auto alerts or your, the radio would break in and say there was an update, people would watch and observe the weather, track storms, and raise flags to warn those on vessels and on land about what was coming. We had a weather tower observer here. Her name was Jessie Taylor, and she raised flags for 82 years. She was the longest and oldest weather tower observer in the country when she retired. The weather tower first stood in Southport at the turn of the century in the 1900s. And Jesse was tasked with listening to the radio after telegraph lines were put in and raising flags. So the large flag on the wall is seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. There's part of it missing because this flag flew during Hurricane Hazel in 1954. But the paint behind it shows you how large the flag should be. Once you've rounded the corner, you'll see artifacts from different storms. And at the end, you will see a beautiful Carolina Hurricanes jersey. So no matter how many times hurricanes come, the coastal communities of North Carolina rebuild. We are a resilient bunch, and we are determined to stay in this beautiful part of the world. So remember that hurricane season runs from the beginning of June until November. So if you are planning to visit or live in this area during those months, make sure you have plenty of preparations. There are handouts and pamphlets here that you can take and prepare for these storms. After you've explored all of these incredible artifacts. Turn your back to it and you will then be looking at our Civil War exhibit. The American Civil War came off the coast of North Carolina very quickly. So Wilmington was the last port to fall and the Confederacy ultimately had to surrender because of that fall of the port. So the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron was off the coast and was tasked with blocking any port and railroad to make sure no supplies could get in or out. What Africans and African Americans discovered was that if they could get out to the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, they would gain their freedom. So these gentlemen would go out in droves. They would go out in groups. They would row sometimes up to 27 miles in the dead of night to gain their freedom. Gideon Wells told the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron that they would do well to employ them. So instead of sending these escaped enslaved peoples back to the plantations, to the homes, to where they were living, the United States Navy employed them in, in their ranks. Now remember that these men were not treated equally. They were not paid on the same wages as, as their white counterparts. However, they did gain their freedom. And when the war ended, they often re-enlisted and moved north. Throughout this exhibit, you will also be seeing many of the fortifications and some of the artillery that was used here in this region. 
please remember that all of this artillery is inert, which means that it is not being used, it cannot explode, it cannot hurt you, it has been made safe. Once you're finished exploring this exhibit, you'll be walking towards the final exhibit on this side of the hall, the United States Coast Guard. The United States Coast Guard has been seen in whole or part since 1792 when Wilmington got one of the 10 original cutters of the Revenue Cutter Service. So since then, different entities, different agencies have built buildings here in the Lower Cape Fear and we still see the United States Coast Guard today. We have the oldest and youngest lighthouse in the state of North Carolina. Old Baldy was first lit in 1817, and it is still available to climb if you take a ferry over to the island and make a reservation to climb. We also have Oak Island Lighthouse, which you are able to drive to while there, you can see one of our original and the only standing whole life-saving service house in this region. So in 1888, Station Oak Island was a life-saving station and it has now been moved across the street and is a private residence. The current United States Coast Guard has a Station Oak Island right in the shadow of Oak Island Lighthouse. Also in this area is Sector North Carolina. Based out of Wilmington, this dictates all U.S. Coast Guard movements throughout the state. And until May of 2020, we also had a U.S. Coast Guard cutter named Diligence. While we have not always had a Diligence, they've come and gone throughout the years since 1792, we hold that name very dear. So when it left, we are sad to see it go. However, happy to still share in the rich Coast Guard history and this agency that is often forgotten. From what we've seen and read, it appears we will not get a new cutter in Wilmington. And it appears that if we do get a new vessel, it will not be named Diligence. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, for taking this semi-guided tour. We hope that you have learned so very much. Please know that staff is here to assist to the best of our abilities, any questions you may have. Thank you again for hanging out and we will see you soon. Bye guys.